Hello and welcome to this week's Life Questions. I'm Jennifer Beck, sitting in for Bill Harris. Our topics on today's show include civility. Are you being civil with your neighbor if they had an election sign in the yard this past fall that wasn't the same as yours? And COVID, riots, election issues. Is that indicating the end times are near? We'll have a discussion coming up. But first, let's meet our panel. For the second week, we're happy to welcome back Pastor Nathan Branham of Grace Fellowship Church in Lima, Pastor Patrick Kamler of Westminster Christian Church in Westminster, Pastor Tyler Perry of Anastasis Church in downtown Lima, and Pastor Rich Reiki of Delphus Trinity United Methodist. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming back another week. We appreciate you being with us here on Life Questions. And before we get into our topics, if you saw last week's show, well, first of all, if you didn't see last week's show, Go to our website, WTLW.com, bring it up, it's on YouTube, and make sure you take some time to watch it. We ended our show with each pastor giving a little, just an overall view of what's going on in his individual church in the event that you are looking for a church and might wanna visit there. And we stopped on this side, so we're gonna move over to this side. Pastor Nathan, why don't you give us a look at what's happening in your church for individuals who might be wanted to come over to Elm Street. Yeah, sure, so we're at 1606 West Elm Street and uh, we have a midweek at 6.30 p.m. We have a Bible study in teens and then Sunday morning we have a 10.30 service and online. Okay, yeah. and um, everybody's welcome, I'm assuming? Yeah, well, of just, course, uh, Of yes. course, I mean, yeah. for everybody, of course, all yeah. these churches are that way. Yeah. Um, so either online or in person? Yes. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. all right, and Pastor Patrick, how about over in the beautiful village of Westminster? <laughs> we are uh, we are having services. We've been back on or back in person since May for the most part. We took a couple weeks off in November, but we're back. We're doing both uh, in person and online services. Uh, we're at 6845 Faulkner Road in Westminster. Actually, if you drive through Westminster and turn left, you'll you'll see us right by the fire station. And uh, everyone and anyone is welcome to uh, attend our services. We have Sunday service at 1030. We gather uh, together as one group, both uh, adults and teens, and everyone is together. And um, as far as, you know, the, the mask question and social distancing, thing like that, if you need to wear a mask, feel comfortable wearing it, wear it. If you uh, don't see a need for it, then don't wear it. We don't make a distinction either way. All right. And as a quick recap, Pastor... Uh, Tyler with Anastasis Church. That is in downtown Lima, 1030 in the morning at St. or at St. Rita's. Not at St. Rita's though. We pray for everyone there at the Civic Center. And Pastor Reiki, you have Delphus Trinity United Methodist Church and you are meeting in your family worship center right now. Yes, on Ambrose Drive, which is just off of Fifth Street uh, behind Arby's. Kind of, I was just gonna say that, behind Arby's too. There we go. Well, let's dive right into our topic on today's show. And we're going to talk about civility, being civil to one another, uh, not allowing emotions to take over and ruin relationships. We had a viewer write in that say, some of my neighbors really surprised me during the election last year. They acted so hateful toward me because I put a sign in my yard for the candidate they don't support. I still want to be friends, but we haven't really talked since the incident. And you know, gentlemen, I would love to say that here we are in January and we are far past that and we are done with all of that, but we aren't. Mm -hmm. We still have the division that we have seen from politics uh, continuing on, but yet we have a God who desires unity. So what do we do? Well, I like what Tyler said last week. He said we lead with grace. And I think that's what we have to do. Politically speaking, we have to lead with grace, love on others, let them be who they are, you know, and know who you are. And just, I, I think that we really need to uh, double down on loving people during this time. I mean, they're not going to change your opinion and vice versa. So as long as we, you know, show the love of Christ, I think that's the most important thing. Hmm. Now, I had a conversation with um, someone. This was back before the election. So we're talking several months ago now. And um, quite honestly, his opinions and my opinions were very different. I'm not gonna share those with you here because that's not what we're about today, but he had the same reasons to vote for one candidate as I would have had the same reasons to vote for another candidate. So here we had the same, even referring to God direction and all of that, but with a completely different focus. And so how, how do we forge 
the, the breaking that has happened through all of the political strife that we've seen? I don't think unity as a country is that we are of the same mind. I think we can talk about issues, we can respect each other's differences, and I think where, where the, the civility question comes into play um, is, as Nathan was saying, lead with grace, but, but the idea that if it gets personal, if I start demonizing a person, a candidate, uh, somebody who believes differently than me, then, then, I, then I'm not being Christ-like. I'm not mm -hmm. addressing the issue. If we want to talk about an issue, if we, want to, if we can be civil enough to do that, then that's where you're going to make some headway, at least gain some perspective on why the other person thinks what they think and why they believe what they believe. And if, even if you don't come around to the same opinion, you can have a deeper understanding for who they are, what makes them tick, what makes you tick. Most of the time what you're going to find out is more about yourself mm -hmm. and why their opinion aggravates you so much. <laughs> and there's probably some soul work to do for us each individually. And along with that too, I think we have gotten into the habit of we associate, you know, if we're on opposite ends of a, a political question, we have gotten into the habit of uh, ascribing the absolute worst characteristics of that other side with that person. Mm. And a lot of political questions, uh, almost every political question, maybe with, with limited excep exceptions, I don't have any on top of my head right now, um, are very nuanced in their response. And just because someone you know, believes in a certain way that you might disagree with, does not make that person a demonic, does not make that person evil. It makes that person have a, a different um, set of, of beliefs than you do. You know, one question I can think of, of course, abortion is a, is a hot topic question. And one of the things that you can, as kind of a test for this, is can you see how someone would be, for example, pro-choice, but also not thrive on killing babies? Because we don't, dis we, at least in the conversations that I've had, and maybe you guys have had different conversations, we don't divorce those a lot of times because we get to the point where how can you be okay with killing children and, and all this kind of stuff. And there's different nuances to that. Yes, there, there is an element where abortion is murder, but we get to that point where we can't possibly understand why someone would come from a different perspective. So again, it kind of goes back to that, what does this person know or how do they see the world in a way that I don't see it? And kind of what, again, what Pastor Nathan said, is, and Tyler too, is that extending grace and leading with that and not just dismissing someone because they have this particular opinion, even though you may disagree with it and your disagreement may be entirely valid, but what can you do to at least dialogue with that person and not you know, throw them under the bus or you're not a Christian or you're not full of faith or you're not a believer and, and then just dismiss them as, as that? We've got to stop seeing people as problems and start seeing people as people, right? We've got to be able to have conversations with one another and see a way to forge a path forward, um, not just an obstacle to getting what we want, right? Mm -hmm. And I think in this climate, there's such a polarizing thing. We sit on this side or this side, and whoever's on this side is in the way of me getting what I want on this side. And we've got to be able to have an open dialogue that says, I respect you as a human being. God loves you just as much as he loves me. And I don't wrestle with you. I wrestle with principalities and powers, right? You're not my enemy. And so we've got to find a way to love one another in that way. Don't you think we've become a, a Twitter nation in the sense <laughs> of we reduce things to the smallest talking point possible, and then we assign that to people as a whole. So, okay, you, you have this opinion, you must be this type of person, and then all the beliefs that go with that particular party must be ascribed to you, and so I write you off because I take, I take instead of the nuances or the full argument or the full understanding or a, a thoughtful conversation, I've reduced it to just a few talking points that we're going to get on some sound bites from some network host or something, and, and I've characterized you as this person as opposed to seeing them everybody as a person and, and I think it's funny even if you try not to do that to other people people will to do that to you mm -hmm. 
I don't know how many times I've visited people in my congregation, shut-ins or uh, hospital folks or whatever, and the conversation will go to whatever is on the news or you know whatever the course of the day is. And well, Pastor, I know you you don't agree with this because you you know you're Republican or you're Democrat or mm -hmm. what. It's it's like they have it's they're fishing for what I really am because they don't know. They're just assuming, so it's almost like they're baiting you to 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 divulge something or to to get into an argument. It's kind of like I, I'm not going to do that. You know, I why would why would I do? That? It, 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 it's it, you could thwart that. You can not take the bait to get in. If you want to have a thoughtful conversation about something, I'm happy to do that, and we can look at it from different sides. But I'm not going to let you define me by a few talking points that you think I should or shouldn't believe because I'm a Christian or because I'm a pastor or whatever. So how does a person who maybe is sitting at home and is feeling the emotional rise of, of that, how do they get off that hot button? How do they f figure out a way to calm down so that they can have that conversation that's civil and that maybe goes somewhere and doesn't just bring up the walls right away from the beginning? probably turn off the news, get off social media. <laughs> I have to admit, it's been easy to get onto social media or watch news, and those things will inflame you because they're capitalizing on these hot button issues. So, uh, and of course, this would be a, a, an answer you'd expect from the pastor. If you maybe get back into the word, mm -hmm. focus a little bit more on, on worship, on word, and on fellowship, but also uh, be careful not to fall into one of the two ditches and that is you know we're we're hyper partisan and and i'm just a rabid republican or democrat or i shut up and don't talk at all you know we have to have that happy medium where we can have this conversation and i can tell you what i believe and and be confident about that and feel safe so and maybe even as pastors we could provide that community and that environment where we can have these conversations one thing uh just as we've been ministering through this time, I find that as a pastor, one of my roles is to give voice to the people in my congregation. And so, I don't know, maybe for you guys, um, you know, not just, uh, not just giving direction on this, but voicing our people's opinions and thoughts. And that maybe in some way vicariously gives them vent and expression to what they're feeling. Um, I think that's important. But you know, the community that you're involved in is, is super important at this time. And uh, so maybe just turning off some of those sources that are stoking, you know, these, these emotions. And it just may be a good idea if, if you've seen something online or some, you're, because a lot of this stuff happens online, because we don't, with limited exceptions, we don't talk to people in person the way we talk to them online. Mm -hmm. A lot of keyboard warriors out there. <laughs> we don't talk to people in person when we talk to them online. but. I guess if, if someone has written something that is redlining you, like you mentioned last week, I would wonder, is, is dialoguing with this person, even if it is to point out the error of their ways, which you seem clear on doing, is that really going to get you to a place that you want to go with this, depending on where that place is? You know, if you're, if you're dialoguing with that person to, well, I need to set them straight or I need to you know, show them the light or anything like that, I mean, is that really going to be the, the best use of your time? Maybe in certain cases when you're, when you're fed up with someone, for whatever reason, sometimes it's just good just, as you said, turn it off, walk away. Mm -hmm. Maybe revisit it later. Maybe if, it's, if there's something in that relationship that's worth restoring or bringing back, or, hey, I, I want to know why you think that way, then maybe approach it in that manner. But just throwing flame back and forth on social media will never, ever solve anything. Mm -hmm. No one is convinced by your political opinion on Facebook or Twitter. It just doesn't happen. And I think maybe asking the question, and I, I think we need to do this all the time. I personally, my issue is uh, driving and dealing with uh, people who shouldn't have a driver's license. <laughs> and, and so my wife, I'm sure is, if she's watching, is laughing because I don't know what it is about that, but I just get frustrated. And, and so, but I, I've had to figure out, you know, how can I pray, Lord, how, how do you want me to love this person? Mm -hmm. How can I show the love of Christ? And I think we need to be asking that to even among non-Christians, right? Especially among non-Christians. If we're in an argument or they have a different political viewpoint than we have, Lord, how can I show the love of Christ to this person? 
because it changes the dynamic. It's not about the argument. You can win the argument and lose their soul. And so I, I think, you know, Jesus has a little bit to say about, you know, don't cast your pearls before swine. And it might be slightly out of context, but it's this idea that if, if they're not receptive, if they don't understand, why are you wasting your time doing it? So don't, don't get sucked into something just because everybody else is having the conversation. Would you say, we're just about to go to break, but would you say as we look back on everything that individuals have faced almost over a whole year now, good 10, 11 months, that we are now ripe for feeling the love of Jesus in a way that maybe we haven't in a long time. There's people who are hurting, who are desiring to fill a hole in a new way, maybe a new opportunity for ministry. Absolutely. Yeah, I think any, anything that shows honesty and authenticity in our dialogue will be like a light in the darkness mm -hmm. at this point. I, I really do. And there's tremendous opportunity for believe, not just pastors, but believers in Jesus to really show that. If you, can be, if you can be honest, if you can be authentic, not necessarily rising above the political discourse, but let's inject this into political discourse, into sticky topics, and let's see if through that, through the love of Christ, through the Holy Spirit, we can transform lives even in those hot button issues. Being a light in the darkness. That's one of the reasons TV44 exists, and that is one of the reasons we have live questions and we bring pastors just like these individuals in to, uh, to talk about important discussions. We're going to have more discussion in just a moment right after this. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. And we are back. We're so glad that you are with us here as we are in our second week of this great panel on life questions. Let's think about last year. A few things happened, didn't they? Fires, riots, illness. So many things took place. Is that a sign of the end times? It's a question we had from one of our viewers who specifically said, I'm looking at the future of our country and I'm concerned about the direction we are headed but I think we have so allowed so much in our country that I wonder if we are being judged. And are we being judged as the Bible said we would be leading up into the end times? Any thoughts, gentlemen? Well, I guess it depends on who you ask. Very good, yeah. <laughs> and I think if you ask the, the pastors on this panel, you probably get four different opinions. Um, I like what I heard one pastor say. He said that, it, and this is for any trial or test you face, uh, did God plan this or did he permit it, right? Uh, and I think whatever position you take on that, you can know that he's purposed it. And for the child of God, the end is always victory. So God is causing all things to work together for good to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. So uh, th there is a whole, there, there is a cacophony of voices right now declaring it's the end of the world. And again, that depends on what eschatological view you hold. You know, or if, if you're a pre-tripper, post-tripper, mid-tripper, uh, you're just going to get a variety of opinions. And last thing I'll say on this is that I think a lot of uh, uh, thought on the end coming from people in the U.S. simply is owning to the fact that we're a little spoiled here mm -hmm. in the U.S. And any type of, of struggle that we face, oh, it's got to be the end. But if you talk to people in China, if you talk to people in Iran, I mean, they have seen persecution like we have literally never known in this nation. And so I think it, we're, we're kind of, you know, privileged in that sense. And I, I think once our comfort is disrupted a little bit, we tend to kind of go to the extreme in that. So is this the end? Well, in the scripture, uh, Jesus returned many more times to his church than he ever just returned at once. So I think we need to be focusing on, well, when Jesus visits my life or when it's my time to die, am I ready for that? And so if, if we're taught to live well and to die well, which is part of our job description, teaching our people how to live well and how to die well, um, then I don't think uh, these type of uh, events will take us by surprise as much. And you know what, Jennifer, I know that every one of us has faced 
tough times. We, we've faced a lot more difficult times than we're going through right now. I think in the in the green room, Patrick, you said, <laughs> you know, we're free. I mean, you know, we well, we, we got it made. This is, you know, it, it's really not that bad. If you put things in perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so is it the end? We don't know. No one knows the hour of the day. Just be ready. Perspective is the key word there. It's absolutely what you said there. I, I totally agree with. I think in the United States, when, whenever there's a transfer of power, whenever there's an election like we had, this 2020 was an unprecedented year. And so we can become overwhelmed. We become fearful. But we have to remember as Christians, our citizenship resides first in heaven not the United States. And no matter who the president is, no matter who the governor is, no matter who your mayor is, that does not matter as much as recognize that God is still on the throne. God is God, he is sovereign, he is perfect, holy, just, and he does love you more than you could ever ask, think, or imagine. And so we can fix our eyes on God, we can trust him, no matter what the circumstances say. Yeah, I, I think there's two, two things. First, to Nathan's point, no one knows the time or the hour. And so my first uh, inclination I tell my folks is anybody comes out and says, that, hey, this is happening, any prediction, any prophecy, whatever, shut them off. Don't ever listen to them again. It's heresy. Just run, run the other direction because Jesus specifically said no one's going to know. It's just going to happen. But the, but the underlying question is, why do you want to know the answer to this question? Hmm. What, what's the point? The, the point really is, how now shall I live? I mean, if you're so busy looking at the future, if you're so busy trying to predict what's happening, you're really not paying attention to how Jesus wants you to live right now. And look, until he takes you home, you're, you, you've got a, a life to live in it. And the sanctification that Christ wants to work in you, uh, his coming back isn't going to uh, relieve you of your responsibility to live a Christ-like life. You know, to the to the question, I, and specifically, I want to touch on the, the judgment piece, if we are being judged or in the midst of judgment. And I guess, kind of dovetailing with what you said, what if the answer to that question is yes? How does that change what you're doing now or how you're living now? And if the answer is no, again, is that going to affect how you live? Are you, are you desiring that people be judged? Are you desiring that these people who are, you know, what, what was the question mentioning? Abortion, alternative lifestyles, violence, sin. Like, are you hoping these people get what they've got coming to them? I look at kind of everything that's happening. And number one, we exist in our own time. So in, in a sense, we're a prisoner of our own times. We're seeing things we've never seen them before. We've never lived through them before. So we get to a point where our automatic reaction is, well, the world's coming to an end. It's like, well, we haven't lived through a world war. We haven't lived through a famine. We haven't lived through a civil war yet, at least. You know, there's things that we haven't gone through. We can take life only as we see it. So we think, well, this, this is just getting worse and worse. I don't think it, it is. My personal opinion is that God is not necessarily judging us. And God, along from also not judging us, did more than that. He actually sent us a savior. Because God is not desiring that anyone would perish, but that everyone would come to life. And he sent that through his son, Jesus Christ. Human beings are self-destructive on our own. Like, we don't really need God's judgment to, to wipe each other out. Like, we're pretty good at that ourselves. So I don't really think that God needs to start picking people off, Old Testament style or anything like that. I think we're pretty good at doing that ourselves. But he did send us a savior. And if you don't believe in him yet, you should right now today. So with you saying that, I want to mention a conversation that I had uh, recently with one of our viewers. Um, you know, we, I, I think it's important to, to think about the fact that there are a lot of people who've spent a lot of time at home. A lot of time, whether it's by choice or whether it's by necessity, but there's been a lot of people who've been in some sort of isolation for a long time. And that can affect your thinking. I mean, we can think that we're, we're right in tune with God, but we can not realize how much the enemy can seep into that darkness of our home. And so, you know, Jesus sent a savior for all. And the conversation I had recently was with someone who was really not sure if heaven was going to happen because of past sins, because of situations that were difficult to overcome. So what encouragement can you tell that person, those people who are watching right now, who aren't able to get out right now, whether it's a nursing home situation or whatever it is, but need to remember that the darkness you are feeling is not the darkness that's destined for your life forever. Well, we had quite a few people that got COVID in our fellowship. One of our 
just one of our faithful members. He felt like while he was at home in the darkness, felt like he was on the verge of death and dying. I mean, it was that bad for him. And he said, Pastor, if, if I wouldn't have gone through this, I don't know that I would have ever relied on Jesus like I have now. And so I would just say to anyone that's struggling with the isolation, even with COVID, that God takes what the enemy means for evil mm -hmm. and he can turn it for good. So I'm yep. just saying, yep. you have one purpose in life. Everyone here, as important as our roles are, we have one purpose, and that is to seek first the kingdom. That is to connect with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And God wants us through this time. He can turn this whole mess into a literal miracle. And you just have to reach out to him by faith. And I want to just speak to what you said about the person who said, I, maybe my sins are keeping me from heaven. Maybe I've done too much wrong that now, now heaven's not going to be a reality for me. Um, the grace of God covers a multitude of sins, covers everything that we can imagine doing, right? Correct. So we look at that and we go, there's no sin too dark that God cannot redeem us from. And when we place our trust in Jesus, we're given life and life eternal. God didn't send his son in the world to condemn it, but that it might be saved through him. So we cling to the hope of the cross. We cling to the hope of salvation because it's a promise that God has given to us. When we call on the name of Jesus, we're saved, forgiven, restored, made new. Yeah, scripture says there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I, and I think when we went through a study over this past spring on forgiveness, one of the things that became apparent to me that I had missed, uh, quite frankly, but my church folks were quick to point it out, was the hardest person to forgive is yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and that cycle of guilt had captured a lot of people. And so we really had to spend some time taking people back to say, look, if Jesus has forgiven you, if God has forgiven you, who are you to hold on to this? Like, why are you beating yourself up over something that Jesus says is as far away as the East is from the West, that it's, it's not your problem anymore. And, and that's, we, it's that cycle of we get trapped up in our mind and we kind of replay the reel of all the bloopers in our life over and over again. And that takes a hold and we need to start replaying the reel of Jesus's victory in our lives and the things that he's brought us through so that we can uh, change our mind, the renewing of our mind by focusing on scripture. And I would say read through the Psalms. It's David's honest plea and many of those of crying out in the darkness, moments of despair, but clinging, as Nathan said, just clinging, seeking after God. You know, I, I, so many of the Psalms, Psalm 121, one of my favorites, I lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who makes heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. You know, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you, Psalm 42. So all those Psalms that kind of come back around and point us back to God, I don't know what's going on right now, but I know who you are. And that's the important part. We don't know what's going on, but we know who you are. We are out of time, men. Thank you so much for sharing with us for these past two weeks. Really appreciate it. I want to remind you, you can rewatch this and last week's show by going to our website at WTLW.com. And that's it for us this week on Life Questions. We'll have a brand new panel next week. And don't forget, you can submit your questions by emailing lifequestions at WTLW.com. Call us or send them in the mail. God's blessings to you. Call us if you have questions about anything you heard today. We do care about you and we're there for you. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us with your thoughts. We are able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com. <laughs>